Minnesota House of Representatives Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform will come to order. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Present. Vice Chair Frazier. Present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative Edelson. Present. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Grossel. Present. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Hewitt. Present. Representative Cleavorn. Present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Lucero. Yes, ma'am. Representative Mueller. Present. Representative Novotny. Present. Representative O'Neill. Present. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Poston. Present. Representative Rowley. Rowley here and happy to be here. Representative Vang. Present. Representative Zhang. Here. That concludes roll call. Very well, with 19 members uh, present, we do have a quorum. Um, we typically adopt the minutes. I just wanna make sure that we do have the minutes before us. Um, and so that's a question to the clerk. Yes, the minutes were sent out this morning. Okay, very well, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, Representative Mueller would be so kind as to move the uh, January uh, 19th minutes of this committee. So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Representative Mueller moves adoption of the minutes of January 19th. Discussion? Okay, we'll take a voice uh, vote on this. All in favor, adoption of the January 19th minutes, please say aye. 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 All same sign. Motion prevails and the minutes of January 19th, uh, 2020 are adopted. Thank you, Representative Mueller. Uh, members, uh, today we're, uh, we won't be moving uh, bills, uh, but we will uh, be hearing um, uh, some important testimony in regards to um, police accountability uh, issues and legislation um, and the intersect of, uh, of human rights uh, with, uh, with such legislation. Uh, those of you who were part of this committee uh, last year um, know that uh, we spent quite a bit of, of time uh, prior and, and through the interim in uh, constructing a police accountability bill that uh, eventually uh, was signed into law um, um, uh, in late summer, early fall uh, of last year. And so um, I want the committee to uh, spend some time uh, hearing about um, um, that work, uh, as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, to hear uh, from our Peace Officer Standing and Standards and Training Board uh, on police reform uh, efforts. Uh, much of that uh, legislation that we passed uh, directed uh, uh, and reinforced, both directed and reinforced uh, the work that the Post uh, uh, had been engaged in and was asked uh, to do uh, some more work. Uh, we will have uh, public testimony. We have three individuals uh, lined up uh, at this point uh, for testimony. So the very first part, uh, members, there is a uh, PowerPoint slide, and I think it'd be appropriate um, for uh, whoever's in control of our slides uh, to do a share uh, screen of that and pop that up there. And that would be our committee uh, um, administrator, uh, Jamel uh, Lundy. Uh, so members, I'm gonna walk through this. Uh, I'll do it very quickly um, because I really want us to have the conversation, uh, particularly with the Pulse Board and with our, our public uh, testifiers. So, um, so I'll move uh, through this uh, rather expeditiously. So next slide, uh, we'll have an overview um, uh, uh, about um, the events that happened in Minnesota, the killing of George Floyd, in particular, particular that led to uh, the legislation that uh, we eventually uh, passed and had signed. Uh, so I want to talk about what those legislative responses were prior and post, uh, and then to uh, identify some of the work that remains 
that will be the topic of legislation uh, going forward through the course of the rest of the session. So let's move on to the next slide. I think it's really important to understand that uh, before the events of May 25th of 2020, um, that um, uh, a, a number of us uh, knew that we had uh, a problem and a challenge uh, in our state in regards to police community relations. And that quite frankly, that awareness uh, had been captured in one way or the other uh, for over uh, four decades. And so the following two slides are actually repeats of information that we had shared with the committee um, back in 2019 um, as we moved to pass uh, a bill in response to that. And uh, in that slide uh, from two years ago, we uh, identi identified a list, a long list of government, uh, Minnesota uh, state government uh, reports that pointed um, uh, directly to, to the issue. Um, examples of that uh, are listed here, the Council on Black Minnesotans um, capturing the uh, racial disparity dynamics um, of, uh, of African-Americans incarcerated uh, in Minnesota, a post board study in 1991, my very first uh, uh, legislative session as a freshman legislator of the study of deadly force uh, by police officers. The Minnesota planning um, uh, report on uh, community crime uh, uh, projects and studies and um, uh, preliminary measures for advancing uh, community uh, policing work in 1996. The post board itself uh, reporting to the Minnesota legislature on uh, fifth degree assault and domestic abuse by peace officers during the reporting period of 95 to 96. Another report from the board on community policing in 97. Um, and uh, a Department of Public Safety report to the legislature responding to the calls involving emotional crisis and mental illness uh, issues. Uh, including uh, uh, policing uh, involvement with that and uh, creating model uh, program uh, pilot projects in 2002. Um, in 2016, uh, four, just a little over four years ago, the Star Tribune poll found that six in 10 Black Minnesotans believe that police are more likely to use deadly force against a Black person than someone who is white. Among white Minnesotans, 28% felt that police were more likely to use deadly force against Blacks. So me members, um, there's both a perception uh, issue as well as a data issue um, that challenges uh, the, pe the good people of Minnesota that unfortunately uh, uh, diverges along racial lines relative to this issue of police community um, dynamics and relationships. Um, the Governor's Council on Law Enforcement and Community Relations in 2017 uh, said, quote, although the lack of trust between law enforcement and community members is sometimes perceived as a metro issue, demographic shifts indicate that communities of color, one of the groups at the forefront of this conversation can be found in increasing numbers throughout the state. So at that point, uh, and again, this is a slide from two years ago for, I believe it was House File 2709 uh, that I authored that we debated extensively in this committee and Judiciary Committee uh, that became part of the omnibus bill um, that we passed out of this committee that uh, passed off the floor of the House and went into conference um, uh, committee. Um, we stated uh, all, you know, a number of reasons why uh, the bill uh, was needed. Uh, the Hennepin County Attorney's 2010 office report on the allegations of misconduct involving the Metropolitan, the Metro uh, Gang Strike Force, DPS's Office of Justice Programs review of the Twin Cities Safe Streets Violent Gang uh, Task Force, um, and uh, misdeeds uh, and, um, you know, found uh, in that. Uh, the Council of Minnesotans of African Heritage uh, annual report uh, which uh, lifted uh, this issue uh, of police uh, mistrust uh, within uh, the, the community uh, reports from the Department of Justice um, regarding the, the maintaining of First Amendment rights and public safety in North Minneapolis. 
the Governor's Council on Law Enforcement and Community Relations, an initial report in 2017, and their final report uh, later uh, in that year on law enforcement and community relations, um, and the DPS's Office of Justice Programs report to the legislature on community justice uh, reinvestment uh, account. So members, before we knew his name, uh, this committee uh, had acted uh, to prevent this uh, tragedy of May 25th. Uh, in fact, prior to this committee acting, uh, uh, there had been um, uh, a, a number of, of steps uh, moving us steadily in the direction of the importance of addressing uh, the issue of police community relations, uh, particularly as they fall along uh, racial lines and particularly as they involve uh, police uh, uh, use of force. Uh, collecting misconduct data, um, uh, and this promoted by the police, uh, um, I'm sorry, let me back up. So uh, we introduced House File 2709, uh, and in that uh, bill, there were several uh, key features. Uh, one was uh, to collect misconduct data to inform policy changes and intervene into problem officers. This is now commonly known as early intervention systems uh, in jurisdictions and states across the nation are uh, both creating and wrestling uh, with uh, this issue and understand the need uh, for uh, the collection of such uh, data in order to create uh, such systems uh, that allow us, would allow us to intervene in a timely manner uh, to be able to um, uh, hopefully prevent uh, misuse of force, uh, including that that leads to uh, death, um, and uh, to be able to assist our professional uh, peace officers in terms of adjusting their practices uh, accordingly. Uh, the bill also granted citizens the power to enact policy changes. This is eventually the, what becomes the Citizens um, Relations Council. Um, and the understanding was that, or rather the learning uh, was that whether it's in public safety or any other uh, entity or any other activity of government that um, unfortunately one of the loopholes in, as we construct pu public policy uh, is um, the um, not addressing the need for our, our, our licensing bodies our regulatory bodies or accountability bodies to actually respond uh, to those citizen dynamics uh, that we create. Uh, granting citizens a seat in the complaint investigation uh, committee uh, in the post, uh, and then spending uh, $6 million to extend police training funds. And members, this is really important. Uh, I won't go into detail, but uh, there is a training account uh, in the post board uh, that um, was um, modernized and authorized for state investment in police training following the killing, uh, the police killing of, of Philando uh, Castillo uh, in the East Metro. Um, those uh, funds had been, uh, and actually are still sunsetted. Um, and so the posture of this committee, uh, of this body, was to continue to uh, make uh, investments in appropriate police uh, training. Uh, in other words, to invest in our public safety officials, but to do so uh, conditional on the necessary reform that uh, four decades of study uh, was pointing us and begging us uh, to do. And so that was uh, the dynamic of the 20, or House File 2709 in 2019. Uh, George Floyd then, uh, that bill was not uh, 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 accepted, if you will, uh, from the other body. Um, in fact, no hearings were held in the other body on any of these issues, much less uh, this bill. Um, and so there was no success in moving any provisions uh, that we have worked hard on uh, uh, to do. And, um, uh, and the sunset then therefore continued uh, on the police training um, uh, dollars. Um, a year later, a little less than a year later, uh, in May, uh, George Floyd uh, is killed by Minneapolis uh, police officer. That uh, then generated um, uh, a, a immense reaction. I don't have to recount for you. Um, uh, first here uh, in Minneapolis, 
Um, you know, so Minnesota uh, clearly uh, had a very visible and visceral uh, reaction uh, that cut across uh, all sorts of communities uh, in the state of Minnesota. Um, that was also then mirrored uh, across the nation uh, and indeed uh, across the world where massive uh, demonstrations um, you know, were found in major cities uh, uh, across uh, both uh, uh, European nations, but also um, uh, uh, nations in other part, parts of the world. Uh, we immediately began to take legislative action. Um, uh, and I mean immediately. The night I heard um, of the killing uh, on May 25th, um, I was in uh, media communication with our uh, house research staff here uh, with other colleagues uh, to uh, reconstruct the House File 2709 that we had passed uh, the year before um, that uh, we had attempted uh, to remove uh, or to move uh, during 2020. Uh, and then uh, like much of good public policy, um, you know, we're, we were waylaid with the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and so we constructed uh, in this committee um, and then uh, in partnership with the Posse Caucus of, uh, of this house, uh, the Minnesota Police Accountability Act, which had three major um, uh, chapters, the Reclaiming Community Oversight uh, Act, uh, that looked at civil law and regulatory reforms, the Reforming Accountability Act, which looked at criminal justice reforms and the Reimagining a Public Safety Act, which moved for structural reforms. So, you know, this committee took, along with our Posse Caucus uh, colleagues, took uh, a big systemic um, a step uh, to address this issue, uh, again, uh, not out of, uh, out of thin air, but out of 40 years of uh, studies, reflections, and calls, calls to action. The first uh, part of that uh, is the reclaiming, was the Reclaiming Community Oversight Act. Uh, I'll go through it very quickly, I'll do the next slide there. Um, it had a number of provisions, uh, including uh, uh, bars on certain uh, types of, of, of peace officer restrictive uh, procedures, particularly the use commonly known as the use of chokeholds. Uh, there was a requirement for peace officers to intercede uh, when another officer is using excessive force and report that incident to the CLIO of the agency. Um, we, uh, we know that there were four officers involved um, in uh, George Floyd's uh, death uh, with one um, um, uh, involved in direct uh, restrictions, uh, physical restrictions of the other, uh, of, of George. Uh, with the other individuals uh, playing different roles uh, in, in that. Um, a banning of the warrior style uh, training, the requirement of the Peace Officer Standards and Training Board to establish a 15 member community, uh, police community relations council that would, as I said earlier, uh, collect and analyze misconduct data to make disciplinary and policy recommendations. Again, commonly referred to uh, as early warning systems requiring each local unit of government of governing body that oversees a law enforcement agency to establish a citizen oversight council. Uh, so uh, uh, reintroducing uh, the role of citizens uh, in uh, reviewing uh, the conduct uh, and outcomes of police community uh, interactions, uh, and then allowing cities or counties to impose a residency requirement. The second part of that, Act was the Reforming Accountability um, uh, Act. Um, this had uh, some pretty technical and complicated pieces related to the use uh, of deadly force and clarifying the, the conditions under which uh, those would uh, be used. Um, 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 and so there were certain standards were identified um, uh, th that uh, would be reinforceable, uh, you know, by law in terms of, of, of the, um, the conditions um, um, that a peace officer is responding to uh, at that time. Uh, it would have given uh, the Attorney General's office jurisdiction to prosecute uh, cases uh, when peace officers are alleged to have caused an, an officer-involved death. 
There was the elimination of the need uh, for cash bail for those charged with misdemeanor offenses other than domestic assault and some driving uh, under while intoxication of, uh, of violations. Uh, there was a creation um, successfully done of an independent use of force investigations unit within the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension uh, to investigate officer uh, involved deaths. Uh, and so the emphasis was on the creation of an independent walled off unit uh, that can um, reinforce the, the public's trust of the objectivity uh, of the investigators. Uh, and they're requiring an officer who takes a child into custody to communicate with or take the child to a juvenile secure detention center to determine whether the child should be released or detained uh, using a risk assessment tool. The final part of that um, um, uh, major uh, legislative proposal was the Reimagining Public Safety Act, which would have established the position of a community-led public safety coordinator at the Department of Public Safety's uh, Office of Justice Programs. Um, there was a provision to restore the voting rights of convicted felons immediately upon their release from prison. The establishment of an officer-involved death review board in the Department of Public Safety, the creation of critical incident stress management teams for emergency service providers uh, to be able to consult uh, um, and uh, receive assistance in stress management, uh, establishing the standards for crisis intervention and mental illness crisis training uh, for peace officers, requiring the development and implementation of autism training for peace officers, and requiring officers whose use of force results in injury or death to file a report to the Bureau of Criminal uh, Apprehension. Uh, it was um, a big bill, um, uh, members. Uh, it was an important bill. Uh, it was heavily uh, engaged with, uh, with, uh, with, with the public um, and uh, went through uh, many hours of development work drawing from uh, previous efforts on the part of of the, of the legislature. A compromise was eventually reached after several uh, special sessions in House File 1 in, I forget which one, was it the fourth uh, special uh, session uh, late uh, in, in August. Um, House File 1 was passed into law that included the critical incident stress management teams and public safety peer counseling, a recognition that there are human beings that work in our public safety work. Um, and that uh, being able to, and, and recognizing um, the, st the stress and the trauma that they face uh, and how that relates um, you know, directly, uh, often tragically uh, to use of force uh, uh, outcomes. And so providing um, interventions and supports uh, for that. There was the investigatory reform I mentioned with the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Uh, there was a uh, element of police residency reform uh, there was an element of banning chokeholds and certain neck restraints. Uh, there was some reform on the use of force uh, and on the use of force reporting. Um, there was a peace officer training assistance funding extension, post-board reform and citizen engagement. Uh, this was critically important um, um, as it introduced um, a strong um, presence of citizens within, not to replace the post board itself, but within the post board that the post board uh, could not uh, ignore uh, by uh, legislative uh, statutory language. There was the prohibition of warrior style training, post board model policies uh, were, were called for, mental health and crisis intervention uh, training was deepened. Uh, and mandatory, as, as well as mandatory autism training. Members, uh, it's my contention, it's a contention, we'll hear testimony uh, later that uh, much work, uh, as important as all this work was, uh, and in the end, uh, we had um, a bipartisan uh, agreement in, in both houses, um, but that, uh, that much work still remains. Uh, there are still, um, and you can move, yeah, there are still um, uh, authority issues uh, that need to be um, strengthened, talked through and strengthened relative to the Citizen Oversight Council at the Pulse Board. Uh, we didn't touch the body camera uh, issue. That had been a topic in pre uh, previous years. It's technically a very difficult issue 
and one that raises a number of resource uh, allocation issues. Uh, nonetheless, one that uh, needs to be addressed and has been addressed uh, to some degree in other, other states. Uh, there's complete data uh, classification. Uh, any early warning system can only be as good as the data uh, that's collected. Uh, there are data privacy issues that uh, both enhance and get in the way of being able to construct an effective uh, database, not for the purpose of you know, uh, hounding uh, uh, peace officers, but for the purpose of having a truly uh, strongly informed uh, early warning system and that the professionals uh, can then use that data uh, to intervene uh, uh, effectively. Uh, there, there are other issues of uh, the use of informants in custody. Um, yesterday, the, uh, our new president uh, named the issue of white supremacy as something that endangers our democracy, uh, our nation, uh, and called for an end to it. Uh, we know, uh, we've heard testimony in this committee that white, uh, that uh, public safety is not immune to the presence of, of white supremacy. We know that's true in our military. Our pending um, um, secretary for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, you know, testified, uh, this is a retired general, that uh, he thinks it's a vital, uh, important national um, uh, and domestic security issue to be able to, to uh, root out uh, white supremacy uh, from our armed forces. Um, I would submit that I think it's important that we do that uh, with all our public agents, including our public safety uh, agents. Uh, there's work uh, still to be done on promoting police co-responder uh, models. There's a great interest in the part of the public to step up uh, to uh, uh, work with and co-own uh, the administration of public safety with their uh, peace officers. Uh, we of late have learned that there are um, new arbitration issues that have been raised as a result uh, of, our, of our legislation that needs to be addressed. Um, there is ongoing need for protections for both officers and those in custody. Uh, there's uh, ongoing need for adequate training uh, and funding, and then there's the uh, unaddressed duty to intervene and report, and so much more. And so members, uh, to close, uh, the work that remains uh, in many ways um, should not, I would submit, should not be approached from, uh, you know, pick uh, a couple of issues here and there, and don't necessarily connect the dots. We are talking about a system. We created a system of public safety. That's our wisdom uh, as Minnesotans. And it was meant to be able to uh, reinforce, uh, um, you know, the, its different elements in order to meet our core commitment of making sure that people uh, can be, in fact, safe in our society. That, that calls for all sorts of, of collaboration, uh, collective action uh, across the state at different levels uh, of government governance. That same approach needs to be done, not just for the immediate delivery of safety, I would submit, but for um, also the, uh, the uh, ever-focused uh, attention to guarantee the human and civil rights of every resident uh, in the state of Minnesota and to uh, really center policing um, in, a, um, in, a, in a manner that is consistent with those rights and that uh, enjoys uh, the confidence uh, of, our, of our citizenry. Um, and so uh, there are a number of issues that uh, I'll be bringing and others will be bringing forward uh, relative to uh, human rights uh, and governance and public safety. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to stop um, and uh, um, express my appreciation for allowing the chair to walk through that. I thought it was important uh, for me to do it. I also thought it'd be effective for me to uh, walk through that. Uh, as opposed to just turning the, the staff um, uh, to do that. And so at this point, I, I would certainly entertain um, uh, any discussion, uh, whether it's in the form of questions or just you know members uh, with each other for just a, a few minutes, because I really want us to move uh, over to the uh, Pulse Board for their uh, important presentation, um, and, and then uh, to make sure we have time for the public testimony uh, before us. And let me pull up my participants list, and I see that Representative, uh, our Vice Chair Frazier 
um, has a question and or comment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, probably more so just statements and I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, but I, I, just initially, I wanna thank you, um, the rest of the Posse Caucus and then specifically uh, Representative Moran. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned or you noted that this work has been years <laughs> in the making. It wasn't, it wasn't just from the result of the uh, murder of George Floyd, um, but in fact, it's from events that have happened over the course of uh, many years, um, not only in our state of Minnesota, but also in our country. Uh, and, and to that point, I wanna say that, that was good work that was, that was done. I will acknowledge that. That was good work that was done in a special session in light of everything that was happening. I'm glad there was bipartisan support to move the legislation forward. And I, I think this, this work should always be bipartisan. Um, because in fact, I think it's nonpartisan. I think these issues that are facing our state, that are facing our country, these are issues that impact everyone. And these are issues that as elected officials, we should be making sure that we lend our voice um, in our support behind to uh, provide a public safety system that is exactly that, safe for everyone. Um, there should not be a concern that if I call, particularly I'll speak as a black man, if I call a police officer, I should not have the concern that there may be harm done to my body or to my family. And, and I have really good relationships with the officers, uh, particularly in my area. Um, I've had good relationships with officers throughout my life, but I've also had some interactions that have been very, very traumatic. And, and speaking to those, uh, to those interactions, that just should not happen. It should not happen in our state. It should not happen in our communities. At all, so I'm looking forward to continuing this work, and and hopefully, um, being joined by all of my colleagues on this committee to push things forward and to strengthen strengthen the Accountability Act um, that was passed in the special session as we move forward. I got to tell you, from my community, uh, and this is across all racial um, lines, um, they want to see more accountability from officers that violate that sacred oath to protect and serve. They want to see that. They wanna see more community input to be a part of decisions that are being made around the training, uh, around actions that are being taken um, for officers accountability. Um, they wanna see any forms of, uh, of white supremacy or extremism. They wanna see it pushed out of the system. They don't believe that it's something that is uh, beneficial. And in fact, and they absolutely know that it's something that is harmful. And I think uh, more than anything, the, the events that we saw in our uh, capital, as more information is starting to come out, we see, and I think we absolutely know how harmful and how dangerous it is um, for this white supremacy to not be rooted out of our system. And if there's any one place that, it's, that I believe it's most dangerous, it's in our law enforcement. They are uh, given a task to protect and serve. They have access to some of the most vital data about our, ourselves as individuals in our communities. And so we have to make sure that those are individuals that are truly uh, in that position to protect and serve and not to do any harm. I wanted to make it brief, so I'll stop there, but I just wanted to add, I'm, I'm appreciative of the work that was done, and I'm very happy to be a part of this team to move forward and strengthen things as we're going forward. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Frazier. You know, I, I, I've i said before, and I'll say it again, you know, that um, um, it's precisely those that we have high expectations of um, that uh, we strive to create uh, high quality objective accountability systems for. Um, if I had no expectations of you, you know, I, I don't even know why I would bother, you know, with uh, accountability uh, efforts. Um, it's the mark of a civilization, of a civilized civilization that we create those type of systems uh, in order for, um, in order to honor the high expectations we have of one, of one another. And the standard is high for those who are um, our public agents, particularly those uh, who uh, have been granted the ability to use uh, force, uh, because there are times when that uh, is necessary. And so um, I, I will say that um, it, um, it'd be one thing if this committee, this body, uh, this legislature uh, was starting from scratch, but we have, but we're not, we're, we have a rich body of data, uh, of social science, of, of political goodwill, of experiences, uh, good and bad, uh, to be able to draw from. You know, one of the weaknesses, if you will, of uh, I believe of our of any democracy is that 
any one of us can be out of here, you know, the next term. You know, we either just, you know, we leave or we're booted out. Uh, there's something good about that because there's a, a rejuvenation, if you will, of new experiences and new ideas that come through. But on the downside, there's the loss of, of wisdom uh, relative to, in this case, 40 years uh, of studies. Uh, and uh, if we're not spending time as a body uh, looking at that and building uh, upon that, uh, then we simply um, um, lead the next uh, iteration of the legislature to start all over again. Um, this is way too important for us to quote unquote start all over again. We really need to build on the wisdom that we steadily attain uh, and acquire uh, from all sectors, including in this case, uh, for our public safety uh, 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 officials uh, and uh, as well as uh, increasingly aware uh, community members. Uh, Representative Hollins. Thank you, Chair Mariani. And I think I'm just echoing um, the same sentiments that you stated. Um, my community in particular, we're right on the border of where Fondo Castile was killed. And it, it has hurt our community deeply to feel like um, law enforcement and in particular our, our elected officials are being reactionary as opposed to proactive. And in that way, I would just, I'm really heartened by all the work that's been done over the past year. And I would just encourage everybody on this committee to consider not acting as a reactionary moment, but instead be proactive in what we are doing to commit to safety for all of our communities and all of our community members. It is something that is paramount to um, our, our civilization and we absolutely must be committed to this. And to echo your sentiments, um, Representative Frazier, this is not a partisan issue. This is not a race-based issue. This needs to be a nonpartisan issue. And this affects literally everybody. Statistically, more white people are killed by police officers than people of color in the state of Minnesota. And so we have to demand accountability for all of the people of Minnesota because I wanna make sure that everybody's children feel free um, and that every person feels like they can call on their police officers when they need to in times of emergency and not risk being harmed. So thank you so much for all this important work. I really look forward to continuing it on. There's much work for us to do together, Representative Hollins, and uh, preferably we could do that in a strong uh, you know, uh, application of objective science uh, across the aisle with one another. Representative Johnson, and then we'll move on uh, to the next part of uh, the the agenda today. Representative Johnson. Chair Mariani, members, it's, I know it was a lot of work with what we got passed last, uh, during that, uh, I believe it was the first special session on some of this reforms. Unfor unfortunately, there are some issues in that bill that I had concerns about, and it was actually brought up last, uh, some of the concerns were ad addressed by a KSTP TV story. Uh, or earlier this month that the state is having trouble get, getting arbitrators to do just the law enforcement only complaints for disciplinary procedures. And the reason for that is there's actually very, very few that go to the arbitrators for disciplinary issues. Um, they've been, uh, what is it, whatever that bill, they started trying to get the arbitrators for that in June and they, I think they only have two at this time. And so it's uh, an issue. There's so few com actual legitimate complaints that go to the arbitrator that, that uh, they can't even fill the six spots. Um, and that's because the vast majority of the time, either the complaint is unfounded or if there is disciplinary action, the officer accepts that uh, discipline. And so they do not go to the arbitrators just because the officers usually take responsibility especially when the discipline is fair. And so I don't know if that's an issue we're gonna to have to deal with. And also in the uh, changes to the use of force, uh, requiring a peace officer to give a testimony or a statement, um, that might conflict with his uh, constitutional rights, not only as a citizen, but as a police officer. Uh, so that's another issue that we're gonna to have to look at because I don't think 
And I do believe if an officer took that to court for a termination or any, because he refused to give a statement, uh, he would win that hands down because he has not only the ten his uh, Fifth Amendment rights, he also has the Tennyson issues as well, whereas to, to do that statement. Thank you, Representative Johnson. I, I do think that there uh, is much, you know, it's not unusual. I've been here a long time, so have you, uh, that uh, we'll, we'll pass legislation uh, and then uh, uh, a little while down the road, sometimes sooner than later, uh, we're needing to uh, adjust, fix, uh, as we continue to learn in the application of legislation. Um, and so I do look forward uh, to working with you on those particular issues as well. Uh, yep, I, that, I, I, I agree with that. There's a couple other things I wanted to mention that in your uh, uh, slide presentation, you talked about the, if I can get it back up on my screen here, uh, the uh, gang task force issue in, from 2010 when that re report was done. I was actually an officer back then. And we agreed there was an issue there that needed to be taken place. And also on the, uh, what, I'm trying to remember the other one here, uh, you know, the violent uh, gangs task force from 2011 when that report was done. We're talking over a decade ago, and those issues have been handled. I was an officer then, and what happened was wrong. It was taken care of. And I'm getting I'm getting a little dis disenfranchised with issues being brought up from decades ago that have been addressed. What's going on now? The only thing that we've had with, as far as riots at, uh, with uh, Representative Frazier brought up with the unfortunate inc incident on... Uh, that I totally believe is 100% wrong as what happened to the US Capitol. But we've had these things going on since four years. In fact, last night they were rioting in Portland because uh, one side, I'm not gonna say which side, didn't believe that uh, Biden was going far enough with his executive order. We need to condemn all violence, whether it's the rioters or if the officers are making, making uh, a poor decisions in, and using excessive force. But we need to stop doing this and, and inflammatory and inflaming things. We need to discuss it in a rational way, looking at both sides of the issue. Thank you, Representative uh, Johnson. I, I, it sounds to me like you and I probably agree more than disagree. Um, you know, violence and uh, destruction in any form is, is something that uh, as good moral citizens, much less as uh, public officials, uh, we simply cannot condone. Um, I would, uh, I, I am going to move forward, but I would uh, take issue with uh, the notion that uh, past reforms or past uh, issues have been totally effectively uh, dealt with. Um, you know, uh, that didn't do George Floyd any good on, on May 25th, uh, that we took care of, quote unquote, took care of, you know, the the issues related to the gang strike force. Uh, there were behaviors and cultures that continue, in my belief, uh, out of sight and uh, without an accountability system uh, from which those activities sprang from. And I believe that uh, it, it's that kind of stuff that continues to manifest itself uh, before us. The purpose of the, the presentation was not to uh, revisit the gang strike force issue as much as to get the point across that uh, these issues don't come out of nowhere. You know, that we built a system uh, and we can redesign that system so that we're not constantly reacting to people within it who abuse it. So that's really the point of that. I, I, I agree with you on that. Professor Johnson, we're gonna move forward. I, uh, I just, uh, one last statement, please. In the discussion, we will continue it. We got lots of committee hearings uh, before us, uh, members. I, 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 I agree, but uh, I'm getting tired of uh, pushing stuff from or, uh, Minneapolis where the issues are occurring and Johnson, lack of uh, ability of the city council to do their duty. Johnson, come on. Don't have me call you out of order. Come on. Uh, I'm going to ask the post board uh, to come forward, uh, post uh, board executive director Eric Missile and uh, our post board chair, uh, Chief Kelly McCarthy. Please come forward. Thank you, Chair Mariani and members of the committee. I'm gonna give just a brief introduction and then Executive Director Missilt will go into detail with some of the um, 
changes that we're making in the post board. Welcome. When I was first when I was first appointed to the post board, I was surprised that it was the post itself was designed to take a back seat to local control, where other regulatory boards are usually the standard. We're really designed to support the local agency. The need has changed and we failed to change with it. And so what we're trying to do now is we're trying to take apart the car and rebuild it while we're still driving down the freeway. And we're working very, very hard to do that. We also recognize that the commitment to equal justice, there needs to be an urgency and we have to attack this with the urgency that people's lives require. But when it comes to the policy and the changes, we have to slow down and be very, very diligent. There is so many great police officers in the state doing great work day in and day out. And while it is occasionally disheartening to have conversations like this, we know we're up to the challenge. And too often, before I got to the post board, I would hear people say, well, where are all the good officers? You hear from, you hear from the figureheads of, of unions and whatnot, but what do the good officers have to say? And so, Posts, we're really trying to make sure that all of our decisions emphasize and elevate those cops out there that are doing great work and are meeting the needs of their community. And we're gonna to continue to do that. So I think a, a good example of that is, I mean, we're in uncharted waters here for the post board, but an example of that is after the killing of George Floyd, we released a statement and that ruffled a lot of feathers. It certainly ruffled a lot of feathers in the law enforcement establishment because the post board had never done anything like that before. But we understood that this was a different situation and we understood that the public needed to know that that was not how we trained our officers. They needed that reassurance that this was an outlier and not standard practice. And so we went ahead and did that and we took some heat for it but I still believe that it was the right thing to do and we're not afraid of a fight. And so with that, we'll have uh, Director Missile go into all the other, the real deep changes that we're doing at the post board. Thank you, uh, Chair uh, McCarthy. I look forward to continue our work with you um, uh, on this important matter. Uh, Director uh, Missile. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to come before you again. Uh, and I apologize, some of this may sound reminiscent of what we talked about just last week, but um, I think I'll be able to put a little more flesh in the bones for you. Um, and just a heads up, because as we experienced with my uh, internet here at the office, if, if I start to get glitchy or something, I will turn off my video <laughs> so I can stay on. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, just a quick commentary on some of the things before I get into the meat of what I wanted to um, uh, cover, or I shouldn't say commentary, but a, a quick update with regard to as, and I, I was reminded as you were going through the legislation, uh, Mr. Chair, that there are a number of things that we did have already accomplished and uh, and put to bed, so to speak. Uh, primarily, the use of force policy has been disseminated to all the agencies that reported back, supplied those uh, copies back to us. Uh, the learning objectives for use of force because of the changes to 609.066 uh, and others uh, have been updated, uh, as well as uh, the creation of autism learning objectives for pre-service and then uh, eventually uh, uh, continuing education. Um, the warrior style training, we've evaluated a number of courses and we actually had a couple come in that we have rejected um, as a result of the statute. Um, so I can report that is in place. And then, of course, duty to intercede and report, which um, just going back to my experience as a police chief is a critical one um, that is in place as well and part of the part of the policy and part of our mandate. So those are the things that um, I, I think are, are relatively buttoned up at this point. And of course, we'll continue to update in the future as things as, as the environment changes. But um, so with that, I'll go into some of the initiatives and kind of uh, progress where we are in progress uh, so to speak uh, as I'd mentioned we're undergoing a comprehensive overhaul of our rules the entire chapter 6700 which drives what much of what the post board does um, just for perspective there are 41 sections in the chapter 
um, with numerous subparts that come cover basically everything we do from initial licensing to violations of standards of conduct. Um, part of the perfect storm of this whole thing, if I put it in, in that term, um, in terms of what we've had to uh, address as a board, uh, is that those rules, as an example, were not uh, have not had any major um, rulemaking done or updating for at least a decade that I could figure that I could find. Um, and the last time only dealt with one section continuing education. So this is a major task uh, that we're undergoing. Uh, it, it involves everything, like I said, across the board from the initial licensing when someone comes into the system to when they leave. Um, so there's a lot, a lot to do there. That is underway. And of course, because nothing is operates in a vacuum, that is the changes that will be suggested for rulemaking are directly linked uh, or will be um, or have to be, quite honestly, to either work by the Community Relations Advisory Council, um, by the Rules Advisory Committee. Uh, we need to take into consideration the audit that was completed and the recommendations in there. So it's really weaving, I think I, I uh, mentioned it last week, it's really weaving all those together to make sure that they're working in, in, um, in conjunction with each other, not at, at odds. So one change in one side of the system requires a change in the other. Um, secondly, the audit, uh, speaking of the audit, uh, that is complete, was completed on time and on schedule in September, October. Um, and we're working on reviewing the details of that and uh, the recommendations and then next steps. Again, in the context of rulemaking and also um, the um, eventual work once we get um, a little bit further down the road at the advisory uh, council. Um, included in that audit, uh, in case you didn't have a chance to read it, was you know continuing education. We're looking at how we vet our courses. Uh, I think I've mentioned that before. Uh, and one of the recommendations was explore a certified instructor program. Some states do that, where you have instructors that go to a, a unified. Um, uh, they, they are taught in a unified manner, and then once receiving that certification from the state, they're allowed to then go out and do the training. Uh, we do not have that in place right now in Minnesota. Uh, certification, so to speak, of, of instructors comes from, you know, whatever, uh, if it's a tool, let's say TASER, uh, vendors, uh, the vendor TASER is the one who certifies instructors and in how to teach the use of that tool course incorporating it with current use of force policy but um, in my mind there's some space there and part of the rec uh, for for the board to be involved in that um, and it certainly fits well with the recommendations of the audit and also the legislation uh, regarding training um, and then of course development of a list of providers and courses uh, some of this just uh, so the the committee is aware um, some of the stuff with regard to training um, is a little bit back burner right at the moment because we are primarily focused on the database and, and building that and the and we have that drop dead deadline of July 1st so uh, much of the training will come into play uh, in the second half of 2021 so we can meet the, the future deadlines on that but it, it's all happening at the same time and we can walk and chew gum it's just how fast we can walk while we're chewing the gum um, so uh, that's that's with continuing education. Uh, Pre-service education right now, I think I mentioned I'm exploring um, with some academic institutions and possibly other partners to build a new job task analysis. Uh, that was, again, part of the IAD list uh, recommendations and something we can do right now and really can form the basis for decision making with regard to training and training curriculum, um, particularly in pre-service. And that's where it was, it was mentioned. Um, so the idea is that the recommendation, I should say, and our intent is to better define the curriculum uh, for pre-service, define the topics, the amount of time that's spent on it, and, and um, maybe even down to the actual outline. Um, that is something that is a little bit more um, uh, determined by the schools right now. We have developed broad learning objectives and then they implement the training. Uh, I think that has to change. Uh, that was clear from the audit, and that's something we'll be we will be working on uh, going forward, and is in in progress. Um, finally, uh, in terms of regulatory functions, uh, mandates a minimum background investigation steps. 
we provided guidelines and post has provided guidelines to agencies for some time and there are some rules uh, in 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 our rules that say you, you know you must do a psychological evaluation that must include an oral interview um, but in terms of the background in terms of you know how you do a background how thorough it is you know do you do you do uh, checks and i don't want to get down to weeds necessarily but do you do a, a financial records check you know do you do you do you do a credit check um are you talking to neighbors that sort of thing there are some um it's not new uh new uh, you know tried and true investigative techniques as a former instructor for background investigations i know what those are we don't require that or define that right now um for agencies um, and I could see uh, part of the recommendation, if we go with the recommendation, would be to perhaps uh, define better what are the minimum standards for conducting a background investigation for police officers when agencies are doing these and looking to hire them. Um, defining non-criminal conduct better. As, as the chair is well aware, and I think many of the members of the committee are well aware, uh, we are restricted primarily to criminal convictions in terms of standards of conduct. Uh, there are some non-criminal convictions we take action on, but they are limited. And the ones that are there are very uh, broadly defined, such as uh, you know, general uh, misconduct or uh, a misconduct of a public official. Uh, the recommendation, I think, something that would help provide some clarity and transparency to everyone is, including us, is to define better what kind of non-criminal conduct uh, qualifies for licensing sanctions. Uh, because right now, and you know, the white supremacy issue is a good one, um, as most know that have operated in the, in the profession for some time or any profession for that, that matter, uh, membership in a religious group or a, a, a group, so, you know, any kind of potential group that you're a member of, um, cross, where does that then impact your job or your license? Uh, people have a right to belong to different things. But of course, obviously, if they're involved in a, in a you know well-known, identified terrorist organization, different story entirely, right? But um, those are the things that um, is that is that kind of conduct. Does that rise to the level of requiring licensing sanctions, or is it appropriate for licensing sanctions? So there are some tough questions buried in here, and I don't want to start a whole <laughs> a whole storm right now. But the fact of the matter is that those are the kind of things that we are going to have to wrestle with as a board and as a profession and as a community uh, going forward. So better defining uh, that uh, uh, conduct uh, in terms of licensing sanctions. Um, articulating the criteria. One of my frustrations here is taking over this position uh, as a fairly new person uh, in the position is understanding in which situations do I order an investigation? In which situations is it left to the local agency? Um, or we tell the local agency, do an investigation and report back to us. I have the authority, the board has the authority to order an investigation, but clearly you don't want to do that all the time. And there are certain circumstances where you, you, we will definitely will, and then other times where we don't. So better defining that again, again, from the standpoint of transparency and all of us understanding and being very clear about what things the post board will, uh, will directly investigate and which things they won't is a critical piece. Um, and, and part of, I think, um, some of the misunderstanding of the role of post board through no fault of the public, but through, you know, it's something we need to define better. We need to clean up our backyard and then present that publicly so people understand better uh, what we do and where, what we stand for. Um, what, um, very minor um, recommendation that was brought up, um, which I think is interesting and something I thought about uh, as an example, and one of the um, issues that we're considering, again, a change, and it may seem minor, but I think it's important, is that when an, when an officer leaves an agency, right now, we just simply tell the agency, let us know that they left your agency, and if they're going to another agency, what is it? Uh, which one is it? Um, most uh, as I understand it, uh, most uh, employers um, or particular licensing will ask for the reason for that person to be leaving employment. Was it a voluntary separation? Is it a retirement? Is it a lateral transfer? Or is it resignation in lieu of, um, you know, a resignation for cause or resignation in lieu of termination? Um, those are important things and, and another, another facet 
where there's a potential catch ball there that maybe is not being caught right now. Um, and is I think well within the purview uh, of the post board, arguably, I haven't broached that with anybody, but I think it's part of um, just indication of what we're looking at in terms of kind of uh, increasing accountability. Um, just very quickly with regard to the complaint database as a result of the reform legislation, I um, mentioned we have- I have, uh, have to move very quickly because I'm kind of running out of time, but, but this oh, is- Oh, you're at two. Okay. Yeah, but this is a vitally important issue. So we'll make sure we come back to this at a future date as well. But yeah, just- Okay. Very... Okay, I'll just, um, I'll just um, I guess, uh, wrap up by saying, you know, again, we're juggling a lot of different things. The complaint database is, is being built as we speak at several meetings. Uh, we'll, we, we still have our target date of July 1 for that to be submitted. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, there are issues potentially with the type of data we're collecting. Um, and, uh, and I guess with uh, deference to um, <clears throat> Representative Novotny, who's on the advisory council, because I haven't mentioned this, the advisory council, but one of the things I want to do the next meeting we have is talk about tackling a couple of things in the uh, IAD list audit. And uh, since the council really doesn't have data to work with right now, maybe a good use of, of getting together and getting um, moving forward on some of this stuff is to um, take a couple of those recommendations and provide recommendations to the board, which was, as I understand it, the intent of the council. So with that, I'll, I'll cut it off so that you can um, field questions. And whatnot. Very well. Uh, members, I'm gonna do a really hard stop at uh, 2.15. Uh, we do have three members here. I have questions, but I'm not gonna ask because I wanna make sure other members get their questions in. Uh, I will just very briefly say that uh, uh, a director and and chair, uh, you know, from my perspective, a breath of fresh air uh, to be able to work with a post board um, uh, openly and transparently uh, and pulling in the same direction. I suspect we're not always gonna agree, uh, but that's fine. I mean, I think you know, the point is that this legislature needs to have the kind of relationship with the, the post board while respecting its autonomy uh, in the way in which both of you have provided leadership and access. Uh, for for uh, for this committee. Uh, with that, I'm going to call on Representative Long and then Representative Frazier. Uh, we'll cap it off with Representative Lazaro, and it's a hard stop, folks, 215. So, Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. Uh, thank you so much for your, your good work on um, following up on the legislation and uh, in general with moving forward on, on much needed reform. Uh, my question is on the duty to intercede um, or uh, duty to report. Do those duties only apply for use of force or do they apply if other illegal activity is observed by officers? Director Bissell. Uh, that applies to if they observe any um, use of force, excessive, what they deem as excessive use of force. Um, I'd have to dig into it deeper, I think, but that that is pretty much limited to, uh, I shouldn't say limited, um, but I guess in the context of your question, yes. It's use of force. Yeah, I, I actually don't recall my, my, myself, but I, I do believe that's correct, Representative Wong. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, if, if it was a sexual harassment or stealing or something else they observed, there would there would not be a duty to report or duty to intercede. Not not with the uh, the use of force policy, which is the context in which this was written. I will say, and the, I'm sure the chief uh, would agree that. Um, you know, most departments will have a, a set of rules or policies that require reporting of, you know, that other conduct that may not fall under the use of force, um, you know, heading. Thank you. Uh, Representative Long, uh, perhaps some work for us to, to also do that. Representative Frazier. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just, just quickly, uh, first of all, uh, Chief McCarthy, thank you for those words you said up front. Appreciate that. Uh, I too, as Chair Mariani stated, uh, breath, of, breath of fresh air to hear that you want to make these changes and you understand there are changes that need to happen. Um, and I can I can appreciate the fact that you want to be deliberate about that so we do it the right way. Hey, quick question around, I know we're, we're emphasizing collecting data and this may go to Mr. Missile. Um, do you believe it, it Will it make sense or does it make sense uh, in your estimation? The more data we have, the better we'll be about uh, uh, being preventative in some of these situations that we end up with with law enforcement and these bad interactions with community. 
Uh, great question. Director Missile. Yes, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any doubt uh, as to that. Um, the, the more information you have, the, the more, uh, you know, covers, you know, covers a variety of areas and, and you can compare data, one set of data to the other and, you know, create linkages and all that without a doubt. And I was really poor at social research methods in college, but from what I remember, <laughs> that's a good way to go about it. Um, but uh, yes, I would agree. Uh, the, the catch is always now what what data is classified as, as the chair mentioned, you know, private versus public. Um, do we want the state and, and setting aside the post board for me, do we want the state pulling in uh, very confidential uh, internal affairs data from agencies? Uh, maybe we do. But then the question always becomes, and the attorneys will tell you this, OK, now you have it. Now you own it. Now what are you going to do with it? And then, you know, what liability are you taking on by holding that data? So that's always the balance. But in general, to answer your question is yes, absolutely. Very, very well. Thank you, Director Missilda. And of course, you know, I, I've made my posture pretty clear uh, from, the, from the beginning. You know, uh, the state has a primary duty uh, to ensure human rights are being met. The state is the, uh, the primary license issuer. Um, and I uh, totally respect, understand, and, um, and even appreciate the, the local uh, jurisdiction uh, issues for effective uh, uh, public safety. But in this chair's opinion, that cannot come at the expense of our licensing authority and or our commitment uh, to guarantee our constitutional rights to our, our residents. Representative Lucero, you have the final uh, question or word here, and then we're going to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I always appreciate conversations while I may not necessarily agree with certain aspects of them. And I wasn't going to say anything, uh, but something that just since I'm speaking, I'll bring it up. Uh, it's just a little bit disappointing that when in your PowerPoint, uh, Mr. Chair, everything in there, there were, you know, this was, it was a bipartisan effort, the, the initiatives that were passed uh, last year, but all the pictures in there were Democrats. Um, and we know that this was a bipartisan measure. I, I it would have been nice to at least acknowledge at least know more of the aspects of Republican contributions uh, as part of that in the PowerPoint in the picture. Um, but the reason I raised my hand here was uh, uh, Mr. Chair and, and Mr. Missel, I, you were kind of mealy-mouthed uh, in regards to white supremacy and then people of faith or religion. Uh, I just wanted to give you an opportunity maybe to clarify that because I was uh, you, you blew past that and I want to make sure that you're not equating the repugnant a uh, belief system by some of white supremacy with that of people of faith. Uh, Director Missile. Yep, I think I opened that can of worms, so I better answer for it. Um, yeah, that was inarticulate in what I said, Representative Lucero. I appreciate you, you bringing that up. That's not at all, at all what I meant. Um, I, I just, as a former police chief, I know that there's always that fine line uh, between a person's off-duty conduct or how they represent themselves, whether it's on Facebook or whatever organizations they're part of. Um, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's a religious, a social organization, it doesn't matter. I was not equating the two. I'm just saying there's that fine line between a person's First Amendment rights and, and rights to freely associate. And then where does it, where does potentially that association impact um how they're viewed in the job or or their employer or or that sort of thing that's all i meant by that it was not i was not drawing a conclusion between the two so thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to square that away yeah, actually, thank uh, you mr missile and thank you mr chair no thank you representative sir i think it was uh, it was important uh, uh, to, to give the director an opportunity to uh you know clarify that uh, and and I, I, I will, and, and by the way, thanks for your advice. I'll look for a picture for Republicans. And uh, if, I, if I ever do another PowerPoint, I, guess I think it's maybe my, only my third PowerPoint in 30 years here. <laughs> but Mr. Chair, I could happily provide you maybe a picture to add some color if you want some. Uh, I've got a, a, a little flair we could add. Yeah, yeah, maybe one with that uh, blue hat you've got on, man, which I'm, I'm very covetous right now and envious of. Um, you know, I, I do think that part of, uh, this is me personally, I do think that part of what challenges all of us, uh, I would submit humbly, uh, is um, uh, perhaps not um, 
uh, a, a deep enough understanding of, of, of racial supremacy and its impact on, on our society and uh, the white supremacist movement, um, you know, which has been noted uh, in FBI, um, you know, advisories and concern for quite a while now uh, is something that we just kind of keep tiptoeing around and, and uh, the better we uh, get to understand it, uh, the more uh, we'll, uh, I think, uh, not uh, confuse that uh, with uh, other, you know, important, uh, you know, belief systems that are perfectly uh, acceptable, you know, for a civilization, um, whereas this uh, is not. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, members, we're going to move forward uh, then with, uh, we have public testimony uh, from uh, three individuals um, who are going to be coming uh, forward. Uh, I think it's going to be in this order, so let me try this. Uh, Angela Myers from the Minneapolis uh, NAACP. Um, please welcome to the committee, uh, Ms. Myers. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Angela Rose Myers. I am the president of the Minneapolis NAACP, which stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. We are one of the oldest and largest uh, civil rights organizations in the nation, started in 1909 by leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, and a number of white allies. Uh, in Minnesota and in uh, Minneapolis specifically, we have been serving the Minneapolis community since 1914, advocating for the equal rights and equal treatment of all Minneapolis residents. So um, uh, I wanted to begin just also by uh, reaffirming what Chair Mariani said earlier, that our work is not done. And I say our work because I see what the Minneapolis and NAACP and what community does in relationship with the work that you do. What I love about our democracy and our constitution is that everyone is uh, deserving of and has inherently certain rights and that our laws reflect our values. It is the work of the Minneapolis and NAACP and I believe the work of our elected representatives to make sure that our laws reflect our values. Our community has for decades um, asked for major changes and systemic changes and accountability for uh, the police uh, departments and policing entities of this state. And we noted the unjust treatment of not just black, um, you know, residents and black citizens in this state, but the unjust treatment by police officers of all of the, of the citizens of Minnesota and all of the people that live here. So um, we are, you know, coming to you again to ask for increased uh, accountability and increased um, you know, transparency when it comes to not just um, the police, the police officers, but also once um, things happen within these policing entities and the police department, that it can be relayed accurately and transparently to, um, to community members. And so that accountability can really um, start to form. So what uh, the Chair Mariano said, Mariani said earlier was how the community doesn't have a lack of trust within the police. And one of the things around that is that we've seen that there are definitely certain police officers who uh, carry themselves uh, in an un with an untrustworthy way. So it is really crucial that as we're going to um, increase trust, community trust in policing, it, it is coupled with the, this accountability because that accountability is such a large part of our values. Transparency and honesty is such a large part of our values. And so um, when we came last year and the year before, to talk about the powder keg that you are creating by allowing the legitimacy of law in our communities to be threatened by rogue and unaccountable police officers. We are asking now again for that accountability. 
Um, we ask for accountability before things exploded. And much of you all without a non-white experience refuse to step out members. And then the uprising came. And I would like to also note, um, particularly since it was earlier, about how white supremacists burned our community this summer. White supremacists burned our community this summer. The supermarkets shut down and the desperate and depraved looted and left our community and many of your speech Again, on the way that we honor, um, you know, that we honor MLK and his legacy. And we ask for you to honor his legacy by listening to the voices of those who are uh, explicitly impacted by police brutality. Listen to the voices of those who have the least, who have experienced police uh, violence. Families, listen to those who have lost someone to police violence. So, you know, the Posse Caucus tried um, their best this summer to put forward legislation that reflected the requests of our community. Um, and, you know, that those requests, a lot of them, yes, they were able through um, bipartisan support. Some of them were able to be put through, but there's still work to be done. There's work on our side as community members, and there's work on the policy makers side as well. And it even, um, but even their thoughtful moderate reforms uh, in a lot of ways were rejected um, straight down uh, the bipartisan, um, straight down partisan line. Racism isn't partisan. And preventing police from harassing, beating, and killing not just black people, but disproportionately black people shouldn't be partisan. So again, we came, can't, we have come here already uh, in the past, we came here to warn you and we come here again to warn you all that this state in, is allowing our city to deny us and allowing our laws to deny us equal treatment under the law. Human rights in the state of Minnesota should not be subject to local jurisdiction. Our city is failing to protect its black citizens. And it is your duty as a legislature to ensure that we get rights guaranteed us by the US and Minnesota constitution. This is not a luxury of yours. It is a requirement because it is also your constituents that are being impacted by police violence. This is not just a metro area issue. This is not just a Minneapolis issue. It is an issue in rural Minnesota and it is an issue not just for black folk in Minnesota, but for all communities. Because when one part of our community hurts, everybody hurts. So um, the first step would be the, to support the policy reforms and other reforms that we'll be bringing forth uh, for if we don't, we lose not just the trust that um, the lack of trust that we see in the police, that commu those community members will lose a, that trust in you in the system that we all need, that we all have and want to buy into and about to protect all of the people and residents in Minnesota, we do not move forward to hold police accountable. It is not just the police that people will not trust. It will also be those in um, powerful positions and positions of power that still continue to let the police brutalize us. So um, once again, thank you so much for having me. Um, these issues are not just in Minneapolis. They are not just for Black uh, Minneapolis residents. This is all across our state. And I want to also hark on this, um, this no white supremacy. What I mean, carrying a KKK Ku Klux Klan card, okay? Um, white supremacy is here in Minneapolis, in Minneapolis in Minnesota. And it is here in a way that has um, actually changed realities for certain um, folks to believe the misinformation that they have been um, taught to believe. And with that, they are 
also endangering our democracy and endangering not just Black folk in Minnesota, but all Minnesotans. So it is really crucial that we root out white supremacy, not just in you know the police department, but in all forms of our state and government. But I just want to recognize that white supremacy creates history realities. We see this erasure of you know even uh, the native folk who are here on this land before us. We see that through the erasure of the black folk who have been here for, you know, decades in Minnesota, and we're seeing that right now. So I just want to note that it, when we're dealing with, we're dealing with and we're talking about rooting out white supremacy, it doesn't always mean rooting out the white supremacists. There are systemic changes that we needed that are rooted in uh, white supremacy that we need to change right now as well. So it's moving from being just not a racist to being anti-racist. And we need these um, right now. So thank you for uh, your time and thank you for having me. Thank you, Ms. Myers, and thank you to uh, the NAACP. Uh, NAACP. Uh, racism isn't partisan. I'm struck by uh, your framing of that. Um, I, I also, um, um, uh, hear uh, the, the appropriate challenge that uh, it's not the luxury of the state um, to um, enforce uh, human rights. Uh, it's actually our requirement uh, that, that, uh, that we do that. Uh, and I do think that this conversation, this understanding of how do we um, also uh, especially address the systemic, uh, that is what we do uh, as state legislators. And I think it's important that we stay rooted in understanding uh, how systems work uh, and that our work is to shape uh, laws that reinforce uh, uh, systems that um, honor and advance and protect human rights. Uh, with that, members, we're going to move on to Justin Terrell, Minnesota Justice Research uh, Center. Uh, Justin uh, Terrell, welcome to the committee, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair Mariani. Uh, Greetings, everyone, uh, Vice Chair Fraser, um, Representative Johnson, and others, staff. Thank you for having me. Um, this has been a very, a very nice uh, uh, break from my normal day to hear the reports that I've heard today. And I just want to say thank you for the continued work that the f members of this committee continue to do uh, on this topic. Uh, just a quick uh, update. When, when I last testified in Front of this committee, I was the executive director of the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage. And since then, I've moved on um, from the state, and I'm currently the executive director of the Minnesota Justice Research Center. And our focus at the Minnesota Justice Research Center um, is, to, is transforming our justice system through research, education, and policy development. We help our community create a criminal justice system. Our goal is to help our community create a criminal justice system that aligns with our commonly held values. Um, we are, <clears throat> uh, we monitor research, we analyze what's happening in our justice system and its impact and identify and clarify the community values and goals that will measure the effectiveness of the criminal justice policies and practices. Our work includes community led research guided by our research advisory board and research and evaluation services for government entities and community organizations. I'm still practicing my rap. I'm still a new executive director, so I appreciate that opportunity. And um, and and uh, I will just say that um, most of what I was going to say in my presentation has been covered today. We all know that the murder of George Floyd sparked out outrage and took our state to the center stage of the globe, um, where people got to see firsthand the racial disparities and and pain that we live with every day in the state of Minnesota. Um, but I will say that. You know, people often ask me why Minnesota, why do I stay in Minnesota, and, and I'll tell you why, because in, in the face of that tragedy, our legislature, our commissioner of human rights, our governor, leadership, um, you guys had a hard time doing it, but you took action, you took bipartisan action, and, you know, the human rights investigation made sure that before George Floyd was, uh, his body was laid in the ground, that we had chokehold restraints in the city of Minneapolis. And we had a, an agreement between the community and the police department 
um, that that put in place restrictions to a, a temporary protection order. I also want to say that uh, the bipartisan reforms that came over the summer. You know, I spent that whole summer. You know, I hosted Governor Walls and uh, Senator Gazelka at the George Floyd Square in the community where we had hard conversations about justice. And we talked about and we talked about the need and uh, to respond to what the community was dealing with because like uh, folks said before me, uh, police brutality and police violence is not a black issue. It is a Minnesota issue. And that is why it is so effective and so wonderful that we see uh, uh, folks in this body and the leadership in the post board come together to do things like ban warrior training, to add more community voices to the discussion, to make sure that we are collecting data, right, so that we can track patterns of behavior. All of these things, I just want to give you give credit to this body for doing the hard work of pulling this together. And we all know what I'm going to say next is that we still have much, much more work to do. The reality is we need to take a hard look, y'all. We don't have a justice system. We have a crime and punishment system. People have heard me say that before and I'll continue to say it. It's a system that protects the profits and property of the wealthy, which uh, people, very smart people like Dr. Alexis Harris and Dr. Chris, U Chris Ugin have had led conversations about how the justice system profits off of the poor and, folk and low income communities of color. <clears throat> and we have a system that divides and controls the rest of us. Minnesotans deserve a justice system they can trust. According to uh, the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage, before I left there, um, we, did a, we did a poll with uh, the Othering and Belonging Institute out of UC Berkeley that talked about where Black people feel comfortable, safe at in our state. The fact that 50% of African Americans don't feel like they can trust the police all the time. And here's what happens when, when we lose trust in our policing. And I'll close up uh, quickly here. I, I see that time is short. I mentor a young man who lives in North Minneapolis, and this weekend he called me after one of his friends was murdered, and he had been up all, day, all night stressing about it, and the reality is that this wasn't the first friend of his that had been murdered. This is the 11th friend of his that had been murdered this year, this year, and why is that? It's because we have a system of policing that has lost the trust of the community that we can no longer, that, that people feel like officers don't even trust each other to do the work right now and are leaving the force at a high level because they, don't, they can't handle the pressure community has put on them, which then leaves a vacuum, a void, where the authority we have given to this body that has, has let this authority be abused over time is no longer in a position to offer the minimal protection that it was offering in the first place. And so, I wanna make sure that we, that this isn't like a blame game because the reality is that we're all in this together. But I wanna make sure that we understand that the calls for justice, the calls for accountability, that all of this needs to be centered in the fact that this young man is losing friends. They're gone. These, these, these people's lives are over. And we have to come together and continue to wrestle with future reforms to make sure that, that we can stop that from happening. And policing isn't the only solution. We need to make investments in community. We need to do a lot of things. But I'll close by saying this. Just consider us a partner, Chair Mariani. Consider the Minnesota Justice Research Center a partner. We do research, program evaluation. We lead powerful conversations like the conference you joined us this past November with, where we have to have a bipartisan discussion with Mitch Perlstein and Mark Levin and yourself and other leaders on these topics. And, and we can help develop policy that, that, that um, look into issues like the white supremacy issue. Um, at the end of the day, we need a North Star plan for the state of Minnesota. And I hope that you can count us as an ally to work with both sides of the aisle to help come up with real solutions, put data behind shared values and keep the progress moving forward. Thank you so much. And uh, I will, I see we're at time. So my apologies if I took too long. Thank you, Mr. Terrell. Thank you for the work of the Justice uh, Resource Center. And I'm so glad that you're there to provide um, uh, leadership. The stakes are indeed very high. and. Um, I think we, you know, if we can just slow down a bit, I think uh, we, we uh, on all sides of the aisle in community out to law enforcement, I think we're pretty much saying the same thing. Uh, we just got to pull it together and believe uh, and trust and push each other. And uh, I think we can do that. 
finally, uh, we're going to hear from Julia Decker from the ACLU, uh, ACLU of Minnesota. We're going to go over a little bit numbers, but hopefully not too much. And we'll adjourn immediately afterwards after Julia's uh, Decker's presentation. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Decker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I... Oh, you got muted. I have timed my testimony, so it should be about three minutes. Mr. Okay. Chair, is this better? Yes. Okay, I'll turn off my video. My internet connection is, is a little bad. Very I well. apologize. Um, well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Julia Decker. I'm the policy director for the Minnesota affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU. Uh, the ACLU of Minnesota is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We advocate in the courts, in the community, and here at the legislature to protect, defend, and realize civil liberties for all Minnesotans. Uh, policing and public safety are undoubtedly at the forefront of this committee's minds and the minds of many Minnesotans and many Americans. Over the summer, we were pleased that the legislature responded rapidly to the murder of George Floyd with state level proposals. But as others have said, we wanna be clear that the work this body began in special session is far from finish. Changes such as allowing residency incentives, imposing a duty to intercede, increasing community input at the post board, these address symptoms but it really is the underlying systems of policing and public safety that require change. Too often the policy response to police violence has been to try and build safeguards against a repeat, excuse me, a repeat of an incident that has already happened. So when police use lethal force against a person suffering a mental health crisis, the legislative response is to fund more mental health training for peace officers. When George Floyd died with a police officer's knee on his neck, the legislative response was to restrict future use of that type of restraint. This after the fact policymaking has not worked. If it had, George Floyd and many others would still be alive today. Moreover, it doesn't address the deep rooted systemic problems that have survived each and every one of these attempts at change. So over the summer, we at the ACLU of Minnesota advocated for stronger provisions in the policing bill and we will continue to do so this session and beyond. We want to see actual accountability, accountability implemented via creation of a state cause of action for civil rights violations by government employees such as police officers. Creating this state path for liability lifts the shield of qualified immunity that has systematically prevented accountability for harms that are disproportionately suffered by Minnesota's communities of color. We'll advocate for bans on invasive and dangerously inaccurate surveillance technology such as facial recognition technology and we want oversight and transparency mechanisms enacted so that other surveillance technologies, both existing and in the future, can't be deployed in secret without public notice or examination and with guardrails against infringement on civil liberties. We'll continue to advocate for increased independent oversight and review of law enforcement officers and their conduct. Law enforcement has the power to deprive Minnesotans of life and this extraordinary power on behalf of the state demands heightened independent scrutiny. We want to see the barrier to empowered civilian oversight boards lifted because policing is inherently local. And so local governing bodies should not be prevented from having full discussions and conversations about civilian oversight boards and their authority. We also want to see an independent prosecutor's office for cases involving officer caused deaths and harms. We'll continue advocating for stricter limits on officer use of force and use of deadly force and increased reporting and public access to that reporting. We'll continue to advocate for separation between local law enforcement and federal immigration authorities. We'll advocate for systems of fines and fees and asset forfeiture that reduce profit motives in policing and increase equity and access to justice. And finally, we'll continue advocating for a reimagining of public safety overall that invests not just in law enforcement budgets, but in housing, mental health care, substance use treatment, and other issues at the root of public safety for all Minnesotans. So thank you very much for staying over and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Decker. I'm informed that we do need to run. Thank you for your testimony and for the work of the ACLU members. We'll be meeting next Tuesday. We're gonna uh, hear the uh, task force report on uh, Minnesota's uh, murdered indigenous uh, uh, women, uh, and also a uh, testimony on a U visa certification bill uh, being authored by Representative Feist. Until that time, members, this committee stands adjourned.